I love the book of uh, Proverbs, which is obviously just a collection of uh, just a whole bunch of different Proverbs. And so, you know, here in this chapter, there's a whole bunch of different things. In fact, Proverbs is a perfect book to, to preach topical messages because there's, you can just take one subject here. And in fact, uh, there's two places in this uh, chapter that are going to match the theme of tonight, which has to do with uh, the raising of children. And so the first one is there in verse 6, of course, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And then, uh, of course, again, that's a, that's a proverb. Now, a lot of people have written entire books about that and made a whole bunch of uh, kind of doctrinal things about that. And, and look, I, it's albeit the Holy Ghost has inspired this to be there, but I think people make a whole lot of it when it's just a proverb. It's a principle that's in here that's a wise saying, something that we need to acknowledge that, hey, when you train up a child in the way you should go, ideally... Theoretically, when he's older, he's not going to depart from what you've taught him. So the principle there is that we need to train him. That's important to train the children. And the second one, of course, foolishness. In verse 15, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it from him. So I'll talk more about that here in a minute. So this topic has been on my mind, and uh, there's a lot of familiar verses, probably most of what uh, we'll talk about today is stuff that you've heard before. For if you're raising children, you've thought about these before, uh, but it comes particularly into my mind in thinking about, you know, I'm going to have to go through this all again here pretty soon. <laughs> I'm out of practice, right? And so I have to be reminded of some of these things. And in Iola, there's a, a couple there that has children, and they're in the process. They've kind of... Uh, started late as far as teaching the, the the kids particularly in my mind what i was thinking about is how to uh how to behave themselves in the house of god you know how to sit in the pews and stuff like that and, and not scream not get up and walk around and so i'm working with them on that on, uh, on the the father and uh, it's going to be uh, some time there's challenging but i had to stop and consider some things and think through some things and so uh this has been on on my heart thinking it's something we need to go through maybe a couple people might listen to it online that could use the, the pointers. Maybe some people in here might get married, have children, and maybe some of this will be something that you'll have to uh, deal with. And so the, uh, the, the topic is the idea of training up a child. And so I titled the message to train up a child, and I instantly thought about, hey, there's a book. I don't know if you ever heard of this book, okay? There's this book called To Train Up a Child. And when we first were introduced to the book, I didn't know who Michael Pearl was. And if you don't know who he was, he is, no big deal. Uh, if you do, I don't really know that much about him, but I've heard people say, hey, he preaches some heresies and stuff like that. He's independent, fundamental, uh, Baptist, but I, I, I think he's got some different opinions on some things, all right? But the book, uh, To Train Up a Child, got a lot of publicity in the media. And the reason why is because there were literally cases where children had been abused and even died. And as they started looking through their house, they came across this book to train up a child. And they started going through there and saying some of the ways in which these children died may be linked to some of the suggestions that he gave them in this book to train up a child. Because the whole idea was, hey, we need to train a child and that's going to involve discipline and that's going to involve all, all this. And so... One of the things that he taught that we actually got from this, and maybe I'll explain more about this later, was to always have something available, kind of what in the old days they would have called a switch. They'd pull a switch off the tree and, and they would use that. And we would uh, use, we used, because other people in the church that we were in had recommended it, and I think it was from the teachings of this guy. And, uh, and they used a, I don't know what it, I don't know. I always think about it compare it compared to those little uh, rods, you know, that you use, but a little bit thicker than that. And they they said, hey, you got to have one of these or a glue stick. Some people use like a giant glue stick. You got to keep one of those in your purse at all times because it's just the right size. And whenever you spank the child, it doesn't leave marks and all this stuff. And we're thinking, hey, that's a great idea. Right. And then the world's saying, uh, hey, this guy is teaching parents to abuse their kids. And and uh, and look. 
oh, of course, the world's going to pick up on the bad publicity and say, hey, look, you know, these, this guy's actually teaching people to abuse their kids, and, and he's responsible for all these deaths of kids that have been abused and all this stuff. And I thought, man, that's, that's some pretty bad stuff. We, we, took some, we got some wisdom out of that book. I, I, I'm never in the practice of reading a book and getting all my th theology and ideas. I don't think I've ever heard an airplane go over this building. <laughs> is that what that is? Or thunder? Okay. Anyway, uh, I d derailed. Now let's see. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I never am in the practice of taking a, a book that somebody recommends and making all my, getting all my understanding and theology and all that from that book. It's, I just don't understand how people could do that, but apparently that is a problem. And some people are like, oh, no, you can't, you know, you don't want to pass on that book. Uh, we were, I was, I remember I was always taught just, uh, you know, chew up the meat and spit out the bones. You ever heard that <laughs> when you're reading something like that? Eat the meat and spit out the bones. Maybe some people can't do that. I don't know. But, uh, but, the, but I've never been the type that, you know, well, I just don't ever read that book. There's nothing you can get good out of it. But we took some some nuggets out of that book and there are some things that we imply uh, we we got from that and we enforced and we thought it was it was good advice uh and there are other things that we thought oh that's a little weird one of the things was there was a lot of uh comparisons to training an animal right this is how you would train your dog this is how you would train break a horse or whatever and they would say so training your children are are is just kind of like that and I'm thinking, whoa, that's weird. Our children aren't animals, <laughs> you know. We don't. Now I had a dog for a little while. We've never been much of pet owners, but we had a dog for a little while. Her name was Lady. Cute little puppy. Grew up to be this dumb dog that wouldn't follow any instructions. And I remember beating this thing, trying to get it to obey me, and it just wouldn't do it. And I'm like looking around because I don't want to get the cops called on me. And I'm like, you dumb dog. I had to get rid of it because I'm like, I'm gonna kill this dog. <laughs> right? I have a lot more affection for my kids than I do a dog. <laughs> I'm just telling you that. Now someone's going to uh, turn me in anyway. But <laughs> but when an animal disobeys, it's, it's a little different, right? It's kind of like you're, uh, you're, there's not really the attachment. I don't think there is. Uh, there should be. But anyway, uh, but some of the principles, and the main thing was the idea of what it means to train a child. And you can apply this to training in anything, not just training children, but training yourself to do something, training uh, a new believer, right, how to do certain things. I mean, uh, what does it mean to train? And, uh, and, and the, the idea of training comes up in all certain situations of life. And, and uh, a couple of things I thought about was uh, so when people train a tree, have you ever seen like a bonsai tree or something like that? And you're like, how'd they get that tree to do that? Maybe it spirals around or it leans a certain direction. And they say, well, we trained it, right? And what they mean by that is that, this might sound bad, they, they tied it up. <laughs> Don't tie up your children. They tied it up a certain way so, so the branches would grow a certain direction or whatever. They trained it. And then I got to thinking about when Brother Justin first started growing out his hair. And his hair was just kind of doing some things, and he wanted to be able to slick it back. I remember him talking about, I need to train it to sit back there. I had to, I don't know what all he did, but I've heard people sleeping with, uh, you know, like a hat on, and you do something like that, and, and just constantly combing it back. I got uh, to train it to do a certain thing. I remember trying that whenever I was younger, like, I need to train my hair. Finally, my, tra my hair trained me. It's like, I want to go this way. And I'm like, all right, do it. <laughs> just put some little water on there. I'm all done. Your ladies are jealous about that. <laughs> but you understand what it means to train something, right? You need to, there's a lot involved in that. So when someone talks about training their children, it involves a lot more than just like lecturing them, re repetition, saying something over and over again. You know, yeah, there are ways that they can learn by these kinds of things. They can learn by lectures. They can learn by repetition. Uh, but there's a whole lot involved. So I, I was just uh, thinking of all of all these verses and thinking about some different things, and I thought I'm just going to go through the ABCs of training up a child. But I'm only getting to D, so don't freak out. There's not 26. <laughs> We're only going to go to D, okay? And so the first one is this. The first one is affection. Affection. It seems weird to me that you wouldn't just have this natural love for your own child that you brought into this world, right? 
uh, it seems like we would all have uh, affection for a child, but we live in a weird world. We live in a weird world where people don't really have that, that natural affection. The Bible talks about that. It says, uh, look at Romans 1, 31. We can expect that people aren't going to have natural affection. Uh, Romans, where am I going here? Romans chapter 1, verse 31. Or let's start with 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness. All right, and here's a list of all these types of unrighteousness. Fornication, wickedness, covetousness, uh, uh, covetousness, uh, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And unnatural affection can mean a lot of things. All right, Natural affection for a human being should be that a man would desire a woman. Right? Man desires a man, that's unnatural affection. The Bible makes that clear. Uh, if a person had some strange affection, and I'm not even talking about sexual, but a strange affection to an animal where they actually prefer animals over humans. And don't think that's not out there. There are people that talk about their animals like they're their babies, yep. and they love these animals and all that. Hey, I'm okay with you loving your pet, but when they have that kind of affection for an animal over human beings, I've heard people say, like, I would just rather move somewhere and just be with my dog over any human beings. That's not natural, yeah. right? Natural affection is what we should. Now, look, you could say, well, I know that there are some animals that don't take care of that. Well, that's not what we mean by nature, by natural. <laughs> What's natural to a human being is that a human being cares for their child, cares for, you know, uh, uh, it has empathy for people and, and all these kinds of, these are natural things that people have. And when someone doesn't have that, you're like, well, there's got to be something wrong with that person. Right? They don't have the natural affection that people have uh, towards uh, somebody. And so, you know, I think about that. 2 Timothy 3, let's go there. It says the same thing. A uh, similar thing. 2 Timothy 3.3. 3. <clears throat> and again, we'll back up, go to the first verse there. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, he uh, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power of thereof, from such turn away. So you see there again, he talks about uh, having a, uh, without natural affection. Right, I, You could try to translate that different ways, but you see definitely what you're seeing here is that there is an affection that should be natural, should be something that people have, and people will turn it into uh, something that is, is unnatural. Well, welcome to the last days, perilous times. You know, that's where uh, we are. And I know you could look at throughout history and say there's always been groups of people that have unnatural affection. That's true. But he said, as you see the last days, perilous times are coming. You're going to see more and more unnatural uh, affection. And so one example of this, of course, and this doesn't have anything to do with raising kids, but one way in which we see this manifested is abortion. That's unnatural. Unnatural that somebody would say, you know what, I, this the fruit in my womb, I don't care about. Let's just get rid of it, right? Because whatever, it's going to be inconvenient for my life or, or whatever. Look, that's probably, in my mind, I want to say that's the most wicked type of unnatural affection. Just like, hey, just kill my baby. I don't care anything about it. But then, you know, those who, there are those who would then go ahead and have the baby, maybe use it as a tax write-off or something like that, and then just uh, abandon it, basically, and neglect it and not raise it, treat it or whatever. That's certainly unnatural affection. Yep. A mother, and this happens all the time, even independent fundamental Baptist churches, but a mother that chooses a career over their children, 
I believe that's unnatural. You should want to raise your child and care for them and invest in them. And look, I'm not, I, I'm not saying that every woman with a career doesn't love her child, but I'm saying to choose that and be willing to lose your child or whatever, these th kind of things happen all the time. And it's a sign of people with unnatural affection. And then uh, also, again, I already talked a little bit about people with pets, but there are those who like, I just don't want to have children. I would rather have a pet. <laughs> right? I just don't want to, it's too much work. You know, I don't want to have a child for this reason or that reason. That's unnatural. You know, a one, I, 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 there are rare cases and there are cases where people can't have babies. I understand that. But what is a, typically a, a child, a, a female child, a little girl, when she grows up, man, she's playing with dolls. And she wants to, everything, she just turns into a doll, and she's got this motherly instinct, and she wants to uh, raise this child, you know, in her imaginary world. And that makes sense, right? Because that's what's natural for a woman. God made them that way. And, uh, and so, anyway, these, uh, the, the first thing, when it comes to training up a child, everything is kind of based off of this, and that is this natural affection. It says, this is my child. I love this child and I want this child to go the right direction. I want to train them up in the way they should go. I want to invest in them, whatever it's going to take, however hard it is. I want, I want to do that because I have this affection to them. It's natural desire and responsibility to my child. I want to invest in them and I don't want to just let them go do whatever they want, you know, or whatever. So it starts with an affection and there's a whole lot I can say about that. I'm sure. But, uh, uh, but let's go to the second one, okay? A Christian should obviously play, uh, uh, they should want their child to follow the Bible and do the biblical type things and, uh, and, and love the Lord. I mean, those are the kind of things we want our child, child to do, right? So the second thing is this. The B is for biblical authority. Biblical authority. The next thing, you have a desire to train your child. The next thing is going to be Depending on the Word of God for your instruction, depending on the leadership of the Lord, we're going to do it God's way. In a Christian's life, in a Christian's life, that should be the case for everything we decide to do. Right? Amen. I remember when I did marriage counseling uh, with a couple in Iola. It was like, hey, this is class number one. What is God's desire? <laughs> you know, we have to get the. It's foundational. You build on sinking sand, your house is going to collapse. You build on Jesus Christ and His Word and the authority of God's Word, then you can have the right family, the right relationship, whether it's marriage, children, whatever. Everything a Christian does has got to be built upon the foundation. So we're going to look at the Word of God and say, well, what does the Word of God say? And someone will read the Word of God and say, I just don't think you should raise children that way. That seems wrong. Well, you're wrong because the Bible is always right. And so we have to align ourselves with the Bible. And that's a basis of love. Remember when we went through 1 John, we said, hey, Herein is love, right? That you keep the commandments. And so there's a certain attachment there between loving somebody and keeping the commandments. If you say, no, I love them more than God does, you, you, you don't understand. <laughs> you don't love them more than God does. And so you have to realize how God tells us to love somebody and to love them any other way other than what God would love them would be an, an incomplete and unholy love. And so that would cause uh, them bad things to happen if you're not doing it God's way. Because God wants what's best for us. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so biblical authority. Look at Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6 is a great verse. One that a lot of times you use in promoting um, homeschooling. But even if somebody sent their kid to a public school for their education, they would have a responsibility to teach their child at home still. Okay, so Deuteronomy chapter 6, look at verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Somebody say, yeah, this is, to, this is written to Israel. A lot of people, man, every time you go to Old Testament, that's, that's to Israel. Well, look. Are we supposed to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy mind, <laughs> all thy soul, with all thy might? Amen. Yes, right? We're supposed to do that. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, 
and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlet between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house, and on thy gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which I swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not. And uh, I read too far, but, but he's saying when you go into the city, these are how you're going to do it. Uh, but this is the heart of God. This is the mind of God. Now, why would he just change that and say, never mind, Gentiles, you don't have to do this. <laughs> no, this is the mind of God that we should pass on to our children those things which he's done for us, those things which he wants us to make foundational in our house and, and, uh, and, and all. So, so we have to go back to the word of God and we have to teach our children diligently the word of God. I don't know if you knew this or not, but kids don't just naturally just learn the Word of God. They don't naturally just go even read their Bible. They don't even naturally listen and comprehend what the pastor's saying when they're sitting in church. Okay, it's just the way that it is. They're going to have to hear it at home. You know, in our life, we've raised our children from basically birth. I mean, you know, for, while they, right, not long after they were born, they're in church, just like the Stevies are doing. And, and that's such a blessing. But you know what I found that I'm kind of sometimes shocked. This is not to put my kids down, but shocked later on in life realizing you guys don't know that. You've been in church your whole life. Don't, you don't know. Hey, that's my fault. I didn't teach them. <laughs> right? They can't they can't just naturally just, you know, they're going to go that direction. Somebody has to train them to go that direction. And so uh, and so this is the uh, the great command, you know, that we do this. This is a biblical principle. And then also the Bible is where we're going to get uh, the foundations for all that we do. Okay, so look at 2 Timothy 3, 14. There are other things that are important to learn that we won't necessarily get from the Bible. All right, I could uh, teach my kids to swim. Maybe I think that's an important thing to teach them, but there's nowhere in the Bible that says, thou shalt teach thy kids to swim. Okay, <laughs> there's things that you can teach your kids uh, that are important, but nothing is more important than the Word of God. And so we can teach, uh, uh, where did I say? I'm sorry. 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3. And look at verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good work. So it's important that we go to the Bible so that we can be truly furnished under good works and know how to live and know what to do. So we have to start there. So it starts with an affection to want what's best for our children. And then it starts with this idea that we're going to, where you're going to decide what the Bible says is right, whether I like it or not. And what the Bible says is best and what the Bible says, uh, how we should raise our children. If we love our children, we're going to do it that way because that's what's going to be best for them. All right. And even if you don't just try to break down biblical principles, which I think you can and say, well, that makes sense. That's what's going to be best for a child. Even if you don't understand that, if you just trust God and say, well, I don't understand it, but I'm going to do it the Bible way. You're going to find out that it was best. OK, because we got to build upon the authority of Scripture. OK, C. The C is correction. Or chastening. Both start with C, both, both basically mean the same thing. And so this is the part that takes work. We understand. I love my children. We understand. I want to do what the Bible says. Now, what is our part? Okay. Now, I, I thought about this yesterday. I was teaching. I mean, I was getting ready to preach. And like I said, the, there's a couple there that is raising kids and having a little bit of a difficult time. They do a good job. They love the kids and everything. But there's some situations and a, a, a past history that has made it a, a kind of hard. And so they're like, I don't understand why these kids won't listen to what I'm saying. I don't understand why they won't sit still and they won't do these different things. And I'm thinking back to the time when I was raising kids and had to go through these same things. And, uh, and, and then not only that, but even uh, when I was in children's ministry and uh, sometimes had children come in who had no upbringing where their parents trained them and raised them, you know, by certain principles. And they didn't know how to sit down and listen to the preacher 
right? And they wanted to come, and sure, we could have just played games and sung songs and all that, but we wanted to preach them the Bible. And so in order for them to listen to the Bible, we're going to have to teach them how to sit still. And so I thought about that yesterday, and we had uh, uh, some kids that decided they just, they're just they starting to get more comfortable coming to church, which, which is a blessing. I'm so glad about that. And so they came up to the front, and their dad said, one of them's not not really his kid, but uh, he's kind of raising them. But he said, uh, he said, okay, if you guys are going to sit up there, you better be good. And I'm thinking in my head, that doesn't work. <laughs> That's not going to work. You're going to have to be right by them saying, stop it, stop it, stop it, or something, you know. But I said, you know, we're going to try this out. And I said, all right, you kids are going to sit up here. Like, like Stevie kids, they sit up in the front row a lot. You guys are going to sit up here. You're going to have to follow some instructions. Can you do that? So I said, here's what we always used to teach uh, in the children's church. We taught them what we called the five-finger rule. And there might have been like an illustration that showed five fingers, and each one had a different thing. I don't remember. But I know here's where the, here were the rules. And you guys got this down pretty good. But number one was sit up straight. All right? Show me how to sit up straight. There you go. You got it. You got it. And so that's rule number one. Okay. Rule number two, you put your feet, I say on the floor, but a lot of kids, their feet don't reach the floor when they're, <laughs> keep, your keep your feet still. There you go. So number one, two, but keep your feet still. All right. Number three, hands to yourself. All right. So you don't have to be like touching on your neighbor or slapping them or whatever. Hands to yourself. Number four, look up at the speaker. No, 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 no talking. Number four is no talking. That's important, right? Number five, look at the speaker while he's talking, right? So those five rules that I gave to those kids, which, by the way, they, did, they ended up doing a great job. Now, Miss Valerie did go sit by them <laughs> to make sure that they did these things, and that helped. But they did a really good job. But I want to use that for an example real quick and just kind of go with me on this, all right? So if these are the five things that I want my kids to obey, right? Let's think about some things that might happen, all right? If I said, hey, you're going to have to do the five things, and all of a sudden, in the middle of, of church, they began swinging their feet. Well, that's breaking one of the rules, right? Now, would I take them out and spank them for that? No, here's what happened. They probably forgot. They're kids, and so they're doing that. I'm not going to whip them or anything like that. I'm going to say, hey, hey, you're supposed to get your feet still, remember? They'll probably stop for a little while, in a little while, they'll start doing it again. I'm not mad at them. They forgot. They got a short attention span. I got a short attention span. I can relate to them. So I say, hey, keep your feet still. Keep your feet still. And so, you know, that wouldn't be that big of a deal. If they uh, started talking, shh, shh, we don't talk. Remember, that's one of the rules. I mean, they, so these are going to take work constantly, telling them. They start to get up. No, no, no. You got to sit down. You got to sit down. Now, here is where the discipline comes. And so what I'm telling you is that in my uh, in my estimation, if I love my child and I want them to obey, it's not abuse. I'm not, I'm, I'm getting, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to teach them how to sit still. I'm trying to teach them how to do that. It's not abuse for me to constantly tell them, no, 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 you got to sit down. No, you got to, but I got to listen to this preaching for an hour. That's torture. Well, you're just going to have to do it, right? And so they would have to be made to sit there. Now, here's the problem, and I can't do that. And uh, I can't do this in children's church when people send their kids on the, on the bus or whatever and they come to church and they're sitting down. But with my own kids, there would come a time where they would do something that would require chastening, right? I'm not talking about chastening and saying, no, I told you no, now you better sit down, you know. You're going to, you know, I, I, I don't know. There's lots of different things that uh, people call discipline that's not discipline. But, uh, but some things, and here would be one. If I said, hey, you're supposed to sit down. And the child said, no. That's, they crossed the line right now. Okay? It's not that they forgot. It's not that they uh, you know, just got antsy or this is really hard for them. But they verbally looked at their mother or their father and said, no. Now, if they're in children's church and they say that to me, I can't say, come here. <laughs> Back in the day, maybe you could do that. <laughs> Take them outside and spank them, right? But for me, in raising a child growing up, I realized... This is crossing the line because the Bible says you're supposed to honor your mother and father. The Bible says you're supposed to obey them. And, and, uh, and so this is showing that they have a heart that is telling their mother or father, no, yeah. right? Yeah. Some people go beyond, some kids go beyond that. Some people are like, man, I wish that's all it was. My kids tell me no. But no, they'll be like, no, no, no. I hate you. Even hit their parents. You ever seen somebody do that? I was listening to this comedian, this black lady. 
and she's like, uh, she's like, have you ever seen that? And I, I know what she's talking about. I maybe have even seen an episode of it way back in the day, but I don't remember it very much, but it was called Super Nanny or something like that. And there's this lady that would go kind of help these parents and teach them how to raise their kids, all right? And so uh, she was like, have you ever watched that? And she said, here's what would happen. Uh, you know, she would go into this family, and this family would be just crying, just like, I just can't take it. I just can't take it. Little Johnny's just a holy terror. And he's so demanding. And she was like, he's three. <laughs> he's three. What do you mean he's demanding and he's, he's making you cry? What's the deal? He's three years old and you're the parent. That's what she's saying, all right? That's not what the super nanny said. This is what the comedian is saying. And she said, like, the, the, uh, I mean, the, the super nanny would watch the, uh, uh, this little kid and say, say hey, I'm going to watch you in a supervised atmosphere and see you, you know, handling your, your child. Which, by the way, I don't need somebody to come in my house and <laughs> teach me that, all right? But, uh, but I'm going to show you how to train your child. And she'd sit back and watch, and the mom would tell the kid to do something, and the little kid, little Johnny, whatever, would be like, no. And she'd say, yes, you got to do that. No, hit him, right? I hate you, all this kind of stuff. And she said, like, the super nanny would be like, she'd go over there and she'd say, now, you're doing it all wrong. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to come down to, the, to Johnny's level, and I want you to say, Now, Johnny, do you want to sit in a timeout? <laughs> and this black lady said, she said, If it was me, that show would be entirely different. <laughs> she said, As soon as little Johnny said, I hate you and hit me, I would say, Go to commercial break. <laughs> Right? That's where they cross the line. And so that's where, and I appreciate parents. I know I see parents dealing with this, and I see them have to take their kid out in the middle of the service, and maybe they're embarrassed. Maybe they're like, no, I don't want to do that. But that's part of training. They cross the line. It's not just like, hey, put your feet down. Hey, sit up straight. Hey, keep your hands to yourself, whatever. It's like, no, now you've told me, you know, that you're not going to obey me. I'm going to take you out, and I'm going to spank you, and you're going to realize in your, in your mind Hey, if I say no again, that's going to happen again. And I'm going to tell you this as a parent, every one of our children have done this. And I try to tell my three kids that our next one's going to do the same thing. And they're just like, no, please don't. Please don't ever spank them because they don't understand. All right. <clears throat> but every one of my kids had to go through this. Getting ready for church. It just seems like it was always getting ready for church. <laughs> You're telling them, hey, uh, you know, hand, uh, 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 sometimes it was as simple as this. Valerie would be like, hey, give, give mommy a kiss. That's probably a bad example, but let's just say, <laughs> give mommy a kiss. No. What did you say? <laughs> I said, give mommy a kiss. No. Take him out and get him a spanking or in the crib or whatever. You say, crib? What? How old were they? Yeah, probably like two years old, as soon as they can say no. <laughs> Little spanking, not killing them, not breaking their back or pulling something out of socket or anything like that. A little whack on the behind where God made put the padding for uh, where they can they can handle it. Little pat, they cry like you about killed them, but you didn't, <laughs> right? By the time the tears stop, you're like now. Okay, let, let's take the kiss away because I remember what it was. It was like say thank you or something like. Was it say thank you? What's it say? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, that was you when you were a kid. All right. But we did it with our kids as well. This was Valerie when she was a kid in case anybody wants to know the dirt. <laughs> okay. So say thank you. Okay. Now we're going to try it again. Say thank you. No. It shows a strong willed child right there. Okay. You, you know, you're probably going to get a spanking, but you say no anyway. But you know what? Here's what a lot of parents would do. Well, I spanked them and it didn't work. That's not training anything. Well, here's what that did. That child just trained you who's in charge. <laughs> so it was a no. All right, another spanking. Another spanking. We would go around sometimes. Every one of our children had this one moment where they did that. Never did it again. Never did it again. So I broke their will. Child abuse. What do you think? They're like an animal or something like that? No. But at three, four years old, when you say, 
you really want to do this? They're like, no, no, no. I want to obey you because you're the boss. <laughs> you say, oh, that's child abuse. No, if it's based on the fact that you love them and you want what's best for them. You think I wanted to be late for church because I'm spanking my child? You think I wanted to say, to think in their heart, they knew better than to say it, but I hate you? <laughs> you think I want the inconvenience of all those kinds of things? No, 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 no. But I love them and I want them to learn to obey, you know. What's going to happen if they're running out in the street? And I'm like, hey, don't do that. <laughs> I don't ever listen to you. Run right in the street. I don't want them to live that kind of life. That's just an example, right? I want to train them not to do certain things because I love them. And if I'm going to base how I discipline them when they do wrong based on the Bible, it's going to involve spanking. And a lot of people are like, oh, I just don't think spanking. Here's what I've heard before. People say, well, when you spank a kid, what you're teaching them is it's okay to hit. And so when they hit their brother or they hit you and then you take them in the other room and you spank them for hitting somebody, you're being a hypocrite and you're teaching them that it's okay to spank. No, I'm teaching, it, I'm teaching them that it's wrong for them to hit. <laughs> it's biblically right for us to spank a child who's disobeying, right? You say, well, I just, I mean, you, if you believe the Bible, you would have to call God a liar. Let me read some uh, examples for you. I'm going to skip Hebrews 12, but Hebrews 12 says that God does the same thing with us, and He does it because He loves us. He chastens those who He loves, okay? But uh, let's go to Ephesians 6, 4. It says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children unto wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, okay? So our motivation isn't, you know, something that's just going to just constantly train our children to be mad about everything. But here's what we're going to do, Proverbs 13, 24. If you, want, if you want to follow along, you can. They're in chronological order, so you'll be able to find them fast. But pro, uh, uh, if not, I'll just read them to you. Proverbs 13, 24 says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son. I mean, that's the inspiration of the Holy Ghost saying that. But he that loveth him chasten him betimes. Now, I used to think betimes just meant like over and over again. But uh, if I understand right, it means as soon as it happens. Then, then you do it. I have to look that word up again. I forgot. Proverbs 19, 18. Chasten thy son while there is hope. And look at this. And let not thy soul spare for his crying. You know the whole, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. And every child's like, yeah, right, you liar. I can't tell you, in any of those times where we had a, spank our, had a spanking session with our kids like that, where we didn't go into the other room crying, saying, are we doing the right thing? Am I abusing my child? I don't want to do that, right? But we had to do it because we loved them. And we weren't, I wasn't beating them like I was beating that dog, <laughs> okay? It was, uh, it was just enough. They say, oh, it doesn't even leave a mark. Yeah, it does. It might even bruise sometimes. And then you're like, all right, I don't want anyone to see that because they're going to turn us into the SRS. <laughs> but look, it is not abuse to leave a little bruise. I mean, hopefully you don't leave a bruise. But it's not, a, 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 it's not wrong to do that, okay? Because what they're going to do, that bruise might save their life. Amen. That bruise might keep them out of living a whole life of sin and rebellion, okay? And so uh, we're trying to get that. Uh, Proverbs, what did we just read, 19? Proverbs 23, 13 from, and through 14. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him, beatest him with a rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Someone said, now you're talking about beating. See, this is like a, a Michael Pearl's book. Man, next thing you know, someone's going to die and, and they're going to be like, hey, well, uh, on their YouTube history, they had Pastor Rocky Randall preaching, it's okay to beat your child, right? And next thing you know, I'm going to get accused of, of that. No, no. If you love your child, you're not going to abuse them. Spanking doesn't mean abuse. But it's saying, hey, when they're crying and you, it seems like, hey, uh, they're acting like I'm killing them or whatever. Look, they're not going to die. Don't withhold that from them. You need to do it because it might save them from hell. Proverbs 29, 15 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom. I like how those two go together. Like, you can't just, like, spank them, and they don't know what they're getting spanked for, right? You're going to reprove them, and they're going to understand what's connected with this pain. And let me tell you something. 
We disciplined our children. I'm not saying we did everything perfect. And, and, and training your children is a lifetime uh, thing. It's not like it can just be done all the time. Uh, we, we definitely know where we made some mistakes, and, and training a child is, is continual. But we did most of this spanking training, hey, breaking the will, learning who's in charge in the household, two, three years old. Everyone's like, my kid, oh, terrible twos, man. They just can't, they just run around, do whatever they want. That's when our kids were getting spankings. Three years old. Some people get past the terrible twos and three is the tough time. It's like three, they're just like a, a holy terror. And you're just like, I'm not saying our kids are perfect, but by three, they pretty much figured out. You'd be like, you're in the grocery store and you're like, hey, don't do that. Do you want, you want us to go out here and go spanking? They know that's not an idle threat. A lot of kids are like, well, you, you haven't raised your voice to a certain decibel yet. I know you're not sincere. <laughs> hey! Get over here! I mean, it just gets louder and louder and louder until like their eyes are just like turning red. Then the kids like, okay, I don't want to die. <laughs> right? No, no, our kids learn that hey, I know that they'll really take me out and they'll really spank me. So by the time they're four years old, interestingly enough, who has memories, vivid memories, like lots of memories from the time they were three years old? You might have one or two memories, but you probably don't remember much of what happened at three years old, right? Four, I have some more memories. Five, yes, I have greater memories around that time. But you know what? My kids probably don't. They remember some because they talk about it every once in a while. But for the most part, their spankings weren't coming seven, eight, nine, ten years old. And if they did, they, they, they had done something pretty bad and they had gotten spankings. Most of those spankings came earlier on when they don't even remember them. <laughs> you know? They don't remember those episodes. Hey, say thank you. No. They don't remember doing that, right? So it was taken care of while they were still young. I don't remember why I said that, but but it's true. Okay, uh, the rod and the re reproof. Did we do uh, Proverbs 29? Uh, uh, the rod and the reproof. Okay, I was talking about both of those words together. Give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Proverbs 29, 17. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Now, that's kind of selfish, but it's true. You don't want to live your whole life with your children just bringing you heartache and woe and everything. Well, correct them, and they'll give thee rest. Proverbs 22, 15. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. The, la the, the fourth point, and I'll just, I'll just be really quick, is diligence. Okay, The D is diligence. All that that I just said sounds good. It sounds easy, but it's hard. And I'm watching, like I said, I'm watching uh, parents raising their kids, I'm remembering some times that we had, and I'm thinking, man, it's hard. It's hard. And so uh, sometimes it just it takes just continual just going over and over and over. But again, think about training a tree. You know, you want that limb to go this certain direction. Look, it just doesn't overnight just grow that way because you told it to. It's going to take a training, consistency, hard work but later on it's going to be going the direction it's supposed to go you know and so you got to put the work in early on and put the diligence in training ourselves is the same way i like how second peter says with all diligence add into your faith virtue and the virtue knowledge and all these things look with all diligence which means it's going to take hard work right so you train your in your own life train yourself spiritually right exercise yourself unto godliness going to take hard work it's going to take a lot of effort but training our children is going to be the same way. And look, training our children is one of the most profitable things to which we could devote our times. I mean, our, our time and effort. It's the most one of the most profitable. Okay, we're investing in them for the future. So let me just give some real clo uh, quick concluding remarks. Okay, number one, the earlier you start on this, the better. I believe that. The earlier you get started, the better. <clears throat> the training doesn't necessarily stop. But the bulk of the work, the bulk of the effort has, has already been done if you start early enough. The earlier you start, the better. Number two, we will all make mistakes. No parents are perfect. Don't think you're ever going to parent your children perfectly. Don't expect everybody else to parent their children perfectly. We'll all make mistakes. We just learn from those and we move on. We don't overanalyze parenting and who's to blame and who did this wrong or what. No. Ultimately, we know when they grow up, it's going to be in their control 
What they do, they're going to be accountable before God for that. It's they're going to be their choice to make. But we want to do our best to help them and train them on early in life. Okay, number three, it's never too late to start. Okay, it's never too late unless I will say I'll add this: unless a child becomes a reprobate, too late at that point, right? What are you going to do? They've been turned over to a reprobate mind because they harden their heart. Uh, look, this is why the Old Testament has laws that would involve stoning a child. <gasps> what were you talking about? You would kill a child? This is talking about a child who you waited too long, and now that child has hardened their heart. You know, they would curse their mother and father. They'll they'll do all these things. And uh, that's another uh, message for another day, but that's in the Old Testament. Okay, and so, uh, but for the most part, uh, look, it's never too late to start trying to, uh, to do this, to discipline a child. And, and, and here's the thing I realized, that some situations are different. The couple I'm talking about in Iola, they've got uh, multiple children uh, with multiple partners. Like they're not all, all the children don't belong to both parents. Does that make sense? And so, uh, and they're starting late in life and they're just like, hey, now we're trying to do right. But you got years and years of, of a time where this didn't happen. Look, this situation is going to be different and it's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. You got people who uh, maybe aren't even married, but the child has to go to the mother for a while and then go to, to the father, you know, on the weekends or whatever, however the, the, the man, that's a difficult situation. It's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be, uh, take a lot more wisdom and uh the, the situation is gonna be a little different i understand that i understand that but it can uh it is an investment worth being made to train up our children finally is this be patient with parents who are going through this process this is what i keep telling the folks in iola because i'm telling you when you have older folks and you've always had it pretty quiet in the congregation because it's like hey, children go to the nursery or whatever which the intent was right the mean it was well meaning it was like we don't want people to be distracted. We want them to hear, you know, I, uh, a couple Sundays ago, when I came up afterwards and said, I got to be honest with you, I don't remember one thing you preached because I was so distracted by the crying. And I'm thinking, yeah, it's rough right now. Be patient. Give it some time. Okay, these children are learning and growing. Uh, so we're kind of in this together. Uh, but it's hard for them because they're not used to that. Right? The person that told me that doesn't even have children. And uh, in the church as a whole, uh, to grandparents, they hear the baby crying, what are they going to do? Look over to see what's going on, you know. And we don't take them out of the service and put them in the nursery. We used to do that because we thought, hey, we'll make sure the parents are hearing, hearing the preaching. Well, and while we're doing that, that child's missing out on some very important training. And so we don't do that now, so it's hard. But I keep telling them, hey, you're going to have to be patient. You're going to have to understand it's difficult now. But if we can help them through this and we can be patient for this, they're, we're going to be part of helping them to raise that child in the way that they should go. And uh, super important that we do that. So anyway, I hope that helps uh, uh, help you think, uh, think through some of these things. Let's pray. Father, thank you for children. Uh, they're definitely uh, a blessing uh, from you, as the Bible even says. And, uh, and I pray that you will just help all the parents here and in Iola and, and uh, maybe anybody that would tune in to this uh, live stream or, or, or watch this recording later on. I pray that uh, it would give some wisdom. It's all straight from your word. And I pray that you would uh, uh, use it, give the, the parents the strength and the understanding of how uh, difficult the training process can be. Uh, but I pray that you'll help us uh, make the right decision to invest in our children so that we can uh, uh, lead them in the right way so that they don't go off into a life of riotous living and, and, uh, and wickedness. Father, we want your will to be done. I pray you help us to learn your word and to live by. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.